Thank you, Brandon. Don't you guys appreciate Brandon? I know I do. Thank you, man. Um, well, like he said, my name is Samuel, and I'm one of the pastors in this network of churches, and I realize you and I may not have met because it's been a few weeks since I was down on the South Hill, so hi, if this is the first time, I'm really glad you're here. Um, and as you can see, I am most, I guess I'm all here, but most of me is working at the moment. I broke my arm, um, still in the month of September. I asked for a vote on this at the nine o'clock, and there were a few people who were kind of like halfway in between, so we'll see how committed you are to this too. I vote we make September re-examine itself because it has no idea what it's doing. Um, a month ago, I was on a jet ski in water, like in swim trunks, and I drove this morning, like all my tires were flat because it was so cold, and I just realized September has no clue what it's up to. But a month ago, I was on a jet ski, and maybe this has been your experience too. You just learn how to jet ski, and you decide the best first thing to do is find the biggest possible wave off of a boat that's wake surfing, not wake boarding. Wake surfing is where like, they angle the boat down, and it creates this huge wave out behind it. And I thought, the best decision I can, I can make right now is to hit that going 50-something miles an hour on a jet ski that I've only learned how to ride about four hours ago. So I go up toward the wave, I hit the wave. Actually, I, I yelled at Bethany while she was also on a jet ski next to me. I'm like, I'm gonna do this one. And she just looked back, I was like, oh, that's a horrible idea. And so I zoom up to the wave, take the wave, get up on top of the wave and have that horrible, oh no, I'm so much higher than I wanted to be moment. You have that, you, you've had that moment too where all of a sudden like unnecessary up until this point facts start playing in your mind. And I was like, at what speed do you go when water feels like concrete when you hit it? Oh, it, not as fast as I'm going. Perfect, perfect. Came down funky on the wave. The wave flipped the jet ski. I held on too long. Thought I dislocated my arm. And then a week ago, went into the doctor because it just wasn't healing right. And he told me, actually, you split the bone like open on the inside. The rotator cuff like ripped the bone apart which is not very humorous. Um, some of you get that. So if I seem a little disjointed today, now you know why. Yes, yes, they worked. I didn't know if that was gonna work or not. Uh, but I bet you've asked that question. I'm never gonna come back here, guys. Those corny jokes just get me fired so fast. But uh, I'm sure you've asked the same question. What do I do now? And I've asked that question before I was on top of a jet ski, on top of a jump that I didn't mean to be on. I think we ask that question a lot. Um, and while we're in the middle of a series on stories, I think that question's kind of hanging in the air. If you listened to Gabby's story last week, Tyson's story last week, um, we are in the middle of a miracle that God is up to around us. I think we can get on the same page with that. When I see 134 people who did not know Jesus, did not follow Jesus, were spiritually dead, and have now chosen to follow Jesus with their life, there's a new person being made there, there's a new life, someone decides to follow Jesus, you get baptized in the tank, everything starts to move forward, and now what? What in the world do I do with my life now? I think we've gotta address that question, because if there is no real answer to that question, and really following Jesus, coming here, is really just one more big self-help strategy, honestly, why bother? You could stay at home, not have to drive through this, and read a book. There are so many 12-step programs. There are so many life coaches who will help you. There are so many motivational speakers who will help you put your attention on yourself and give you a better life. And so if there's really nothing to look forward to in this life past just knowing Jesus, and then I kind of put everything on hold till heaven, right? Why bother with this whole Jesus following mission that we're on? Why bother coming to church? Why bother even being here? Honestly, if there's nothing to look forward to past heaven, or if there's nothing to look forward to in the meantime, you're wasting your time. I'm wasting my time. We're wasting our time. There's gotta be something more than just the moment when I choose to give Jesus my life. There's gotta be a reason he doesn't just whisk me into heaven, right? There's gotta be a purpose for our life here. Jesus knows that you and I are asking that question, and so he, he spoke to a guy named Paul who wrote a letter to a couple young Jesus followers that were forming a church in, um, a church in Ephesus. So he wrote a letter to the Ephesians, and that's where we're gonna pick up. Paul writes, this is Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. After he's kind of helped them zoom out, because they're asking the same question. Okay, we believe in Jesus, we believe. Now what do we do? What's the plan now? Am I supposed to just like go back as like to life as per usual before he says, nope, 
God saved you by his grace. This is verse eight. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God for salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Amen. I appreciate you. None of us can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us a long time ago. Yeah, I'm with you, absolutely. See, Jesus knows, God knows, that you and I have this kind of hunger inside us for something a little bit more than a slightly better version of my previous life. That's why you and I, when we, when we watch stories, right, we watch a story about a hero, someone who's lived an extraordinary life, a meaningful life, a purposeful life. There's a piece of us that enjoys that story because you want to be that person, I want to be that person. Right? I don't wanna be the spectator, I don't wanna be the extra in the movie. There's a part of me that really wants to be the main character or maybe the supporting main character because it's not quite as much pressure, right? But I still get to be a part of it. And as soon as you and I want that kind of life, there's also a flip side that says, I'm sure I could never be that person. You know, I'm sure I don't have the capacity to be that kind of leader. I'm sure maybe I'm not, um, Maybe I'm not good looking enough to get that many people to like me. Maybe I have the wrong personality. Maybe I don't have enough money or time or skills or tools, but whatever that extraordinary life is, I'm sure I could never get there. The best thing I can do is just look at myself and try and maybe chip away at a few weak spots and hope maybe a little bit better version of me will emerge. You see, I believe Jesus has a much better picture for your life than that. Because he writes through this, this guy, Paul, um, what how God sees you is not now that you've decided to follow Jesus, a slightly better version of you. God sees you as a masterpiece. God made you on purpose, knowing all of the flaws in you, knowing all the imperfections in you. See, when you decided to follow Jesus, all of a sudden, it wasn't like the upgraded of me, version of me emerged. It was a whole new person came out of nothing. The wreckage of my life was transformed into a masterpiece and God created me anew. And so God made you on purpose for a very specific purpose that he wants for your life. And so if God did make you on purpose for a purpose, and God's the one who gets to decide what that purpose is and what it looks like and what are those good things that he has planned for you to do, I would want to figure that out because I would hate to miss it because I've disqualified myself, right? And I would also hate to spend my whole life engineering my own masterpiece. Some of you are irritated that we're having this conversation, period, because you're already in full swing on your own masterpiece. You already have a plan and all of this conversation is just interrupting that plan. But if Jesus saved your life and if Jesus invites you into a relationship with him because there's a purpose for that life, if God made you on purpose for a purpose, then I would want to figure out what that is, wouldn't you? I'd like to invite up a couple people to help me tell some of that story. So I'd like um, Jason and Amy and Elizabeth to join me up on stage. Um, yeah, come on up, come on up, guys. Um, these, are, these are people who have been stepping into a little bit of what God's designed them for around here. And I really want you to lean in over the course of this conversation and begin to hear, hey, what's God up to in this person's life? Um, because I do believe the second that we begin to kind of flip the narrative from either I have to make myself a masterpiece or I never could be a masterpiece, realizing that God has made us a masterpiece, that you are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus for the good works he's planned for you to do a long time ago. That's something for us to step into and I'd like to find out what it is with you together. So would you make these guys feel really welcome with me? Hey. Okay. We're gonna try that again. Here's, here's why, if you are up on stage, no, no, hang on just for a second. You know, I know the whole church thing can be weird where we all sit in seats and there's a couple guys who, or people who sit on stage or talk on stage, but if you were coming up onto this stage with me, wouldn't you wanna know that there was a whole room of people that were for you? Like, wouldn't you wanna know that? Wouldn't you wanna know that they believe in you, they're not waiting for you to fail, they're with you? I definitely would. So let's try that again. Are you glad that they're up on stage at all with me? Come on, come on, there we go. Hey, 
Guys, I'm, I'm really excited for you to be up here with me. We're just going to have a conversation together. I want you to lean in with me. Um, Jason and Amy Finke just started leading a group here on the South Hill. You've been here um, really since the South Hill launched. Elizabeth, you've also just stepped into leading a group. Both your groups are like two, three weeks old. So let's zoom back just a little bit, shall we, to where were you at, kind of what was life like as you were beginning to get connected here? What about for you, Elizabeth? Oh, well, um, for me, like in about four months like um, time, I had discovered that my husband had a girlfriend and he was leaving me for her. Um, my mom passed away. I lost my house and I totaled my car. So when I got here to the South Hill, I was stripped of everything that I knew, all my comfort, and I was broken and, and just a lot of pain, really. Yeah. yeah. You said there were some people who really began to love you as you got more connected around here. Um, how did they love you and why was that so significant for you? Yeah. Um, so I came from the north side where I knew um, <coughs> Bill and Claudia Ritter, um, Dustin and um, Amber Schumacher. And they really helped me like financially. They made sure I had everything that I need when I lost my house. They packed my house. They moved my house. They unpacked my house into my new apartment. Um, I had brothers, um, Zach and um, Norman Erickson, who prayed for me. Brandon Westner was um, someone in my life who was praying for me. Um, definitely a ton of people, Chris, uh, sorry, Josh and Christy Cross. Um, invited me to the front row to sit with them. and um, <laughs> Oh, the front there, row. Yeah, the front row, and there I have stayed. So, um, yeah, I just, like, really got to, like, experience God using his people to love you through life and to walk you through tragedy or, you know, whatever it is, and I just decided I wanted to do that for others. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, Amy, actually, Jason, I'll start with you. What about you? Where were you at when you began to get connected around here? Uh, so... Uh, we were going to the Northside Church after a 10-year period. Um, um, we had immersed ourselves into church, and through a series of events, um, got some stinking thinking about our attitudes and uh, <laughs> our beliefs about what church was, and so we had to step back. I believe God was leading us in that. Um, started changing our hearts, and we ended up at, at the Northside uh, One uh, Real Life, and uh God started to change our hearts there. Um, hearing we're here to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. For me, that was awesome. That was bigger. Um, doing life by yourselves with our family was great. <laughs> with God, uh, it was easy. Uh, we were comfortable uh, with my wife and I and my kids. Um, my kids were a big driver in us coming back to church. Um, I wanted, wanted them to have all the opportunities and experiences, but we could only take it so far. And we needed mm. God's help, and um, so we were looking for connection, and that's where we were. Yeah. yeah. Amy, what about you? Yeah, and then uh, so after about a year and a half um, of just going um, to church and not really connecting ever, mm -hmm. um, we decided that it was time to kind of – we just really felt like the Lord was leading us into a new season. And so we um, headed up here to the South Hill and uh, to check it out. And and uh, and Bethany and Samuel invited us to their connect group, and um, I think that was kind of the the beginning of um, some really great things that the Lord is doing. And um, saying yes to an invitation to a connect group because um, then all of a sudden we had people and we had a mm. sense of belonging um, when we came to church on Sunday. Yeah, mm -hmm. Elizabeth, you said. Um, as God be kind of, he, he began to move in you, began to motivate you. Um, you had, you told me on the phone, you really began to sense that God is moving. He wants to invite you to join in. Could you unpack kind of what he started to do a little bit in you as he began to motivate you to lead? Yeah, absolutely. He just, um, began to give me his vision for Spokane and the South Hill. And, um, it was just, it was just basically that he just said, like, look, babe, like I'm moving all over the city I'm moving all over the world and I'm doing it whether you join me or not do you want it you know do you want to get in on what I'm doing or do you want to watch so yeah well and you said yeah that's super easy for me I know everything and I have all this time and room oh, in yeah. my life yeah 
absolutely, you don't know about me, but um, <laughs> no, uh, absolutely not. Um, I, I'm a single mom with three kids. Um, I work three jobs. So I have like no time, right? It, it looks like um, it's really crazy. I have to know my, my schedule, my kids' schedule, their dad's schedule, trying to fit everything in. And um, yeah, it's, it can be crazy. Home life is crazy. Things happen. Um, so yeah, I have cereal on my um, living room floor right now that I'm trying not to think about. So like, <laughs> it's really crazy if I can get that way. Um, also, I'm, I'm not educated. I didn't even go to high school. I was told a lot that I was stupid and um, embarrassing. Hmm. Um, and so God really just like had to mend those pieces and take me and say, look, babe, I made you just the way you are. Like, I love who you are. Um, I love that you're ridiculous and an idiot in like the best possible <laughs> way. And, um, yeah, and it just, I really began to, to embrace and grow in that. And he made time where I thought there was no time. Um, all of a sudden I had energy, I had courage, I had strength. I just was able to move in him and not in my own power. Wow. Move in him and not in your own power. That's, I'll save that one and use it later. I love that. Uh, Amy, what, what began to change in you? You know, I know there's some external things you got referenced. Um, you know, you have three kids, you both work. Jason, you'd said, hey, three teenage girls are, uh, that's plenty by itself. Yes, I, I can say that so you don't have to. So, <laughs> but um, you, you mentioned there are several things that were kind of internal things that also had to begin to shift and change in you. Um, what were some of those things that God began to do in you, Amy? Oh, gosh. Well, um, there just were some heart beliefs uh, that, I, that I believed about myself. And, and that, I mean, some of them were, um, you're, um, you're too much. You're too intense. You're too um, serious. You're too passionate that it turns people off. And, I, you know, just things that I believed about myself. And... Um, that just true, just simply were not, they were, they were lies from the enemy. Mm. And um, the Lord brought me to the story of the prodigal son. And he, would you like, are you You're good. Tired? You're fine. <laughs> um, he brought me to the story of the prodigal son. And um, I had always identified with the older brother. And the older brother felt like he was always working hard and doing what he needed to do. But he was always passed over. Mm. and um, wasn't recognized. And really, um, that was me. I felt like I didn't matter. And, um, and I really uh, lived my life with a victim mindset. Poor me. And, um, and God, th and I felt, I thought that that was my identity. And God said to me, Amy, look at the father. What is the father doing in the story? And I said, well, he, you know, he's standing there and he's, he's looking out. And he said, that is what I want for you. I want you to have the heart of the Father and the eyes of the Father, that you are looking out and seeing people that are coming. You're seeing the prodigal. You're seeing the, the older brother. And that you are not so entrenched and immersed in looking internally, looking at yourself, but that your eyes are focused outward. And, um, and that's what he started to do in me, was to cause me and help me to um, turn my gaze outward. Yeah. Jason, what about you? How did God begin to shape you, transform you in the middle of some of this? Yeah, so still working with some of that stinking thinking from <laughs> years ago, um, when God says, hey, come to the South Hill. First Sunday, Brandon Wessner came up and grabbed my girls. <laughs> hey, what burns in you? What What are your talents? What are your skills? You know, and for Amy and I, that's exactly what we wanted for our girls. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's it's here, it's coming. And so, what that allowed me to do was kind of break down some of the walls that I had, let let those things down, and, and let those things go. And um, you know, another thought that I had was, you know, I was a, I thought I was a failure in the past when we dumped ourselves into church. I didn't, I wasn't successful in that. And so I really, I really tried to fight that, that, you know, God could still use me in the capacity in church and, and in ministry, and um, he started doing that, and first steps were uh, saying yes, 
saying yes to helping David with the teardown, saying yes to being involved in the security, um, meeting Nick, and then saying yes to Josh about doing one-on-one with him. And all of a sudden, God was expanding my capacity um, and exponentially growing me in a pace mm-hmm. that I can't even recognize. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, if you look... Um, you know, Elizabeth, if you look back at maybe life two years ago, would two years ago, Elizabeth, recognize you today? Uh, definitely not. Um, yeah, no, I, I've had a lot of fear and um, just didn't think that I was well enough equipped. And um, as I started to, you know, open up and say, okay, God, like, yeah, I, I hear you. I'll, I'll do what you're calling me to do, but like in my own comfort, okay? Hmm. Like, you know, I was, I was putting him in this box and like he had to meet all these requirements for me to step out and like he had to provide for me, you know, before I stepped out. And God was like, uh-uh, like that's not how I work. That's not <laughs> how this goes. Like take a step forward, take a step. Hmm. And so I did. And as I did, it's like there wow. came more healing there. I saw like time where there shouldn't be time. Finances aren't making sense. Like somehow I have more um, money than I have month. And that's like incredible. And just all of these things happening, like feel, building confidence and, and knowing that uh, my wisdom and all these things come from him. And so, yeah, no, uh, two years ago, no, this is not at all where I thought I would be, what I'd be doing. Yeah. Amy, if you're, if you're talking to a young leader in the room, maybe it's um, just someone saying, hey, I don't feel like a leader. This all sounds way beyond my comfort zone or beyond anything I could ever do. What would you tell him? Um, I would say... I completely understand. Mm. I would say um, it's probably that that's probably a really good place to be Um, because I don't see myself as a leader either, but what I do see is a follower of Christ and that um, I think it's really, really powerful to be able to look out and see people and say, Hey, I I'm not really sure how to do this either, but will you, why don't will you come with me and in, come and see what Jesus is doing? And I struggled with that older brother inside of me for so long, and I wanted him to be gone. <laughs> I wanted to be free of him, and I didn't know how to to get to that place. Um, but what I've found is that. It has happened through obedience. It hasn't happened through me focusing more on myself and, um, you know, oh, God, just take this pride from me and take this self-righteousness mm-hmm. from me. It hasn't happened like that. What has happened is God has said to me, Amy, go pray for that woman. And, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I've gone and I've prayed for that woman. Mm. Amy, I would like you to (laughs) stand on a stage and host and be the most uncomfortable you have ever been in your entire life. And I cried and I kicked and I screamed um, at home. Um, (laughs) And then I came came here and I smiled and I made her pretend like everything was fine. But but I, I know that that older brother is gone those chains are broken and that song that says look where my chains are now they're back there they're gone I've been set free and I've been set free because of obedience Hmm. yeah amen Amen. don't you appreciate Jason and Amy and Elizabeth thank you so much yeah I appreciate you guys time yeah yeah Well, now that they've preached, there's really no point for me to be up here, is there? Um, don't you want to be in their group? I, w- I want to be in the Thinkies group. I want to be in Elizabeth's group. I can't because Elizabeth's group is a women's group. So I can't be in that group. But, um, you know, it's, it's pretty inspiring, isn't it? Seeing some of the pictures of what God is up to in the lives of ordinary, like Elizabeth said, unschooled people like us. Isn't that just how Jesus works? 
Isn't that the way that he wants to work? I, I keep on thinking back to that picture in Acts 4. A few of the apostles are teaching and they're preaching and literally thousands of people are coming to know Jesus and they get dragged in front of the council of religious leaders at the time and those guys are all confused looking at these men realizing these are unschooled ordinary men. The only, the only defining characteristics of their lives that all have like a common thread here is they've spent time with Jesus and they say yes to Jesus and look what God is up to with their life. And that life of Jesus, that connection to Jesus, that's the hinge point. Like, I hope you hear that in Jason and Amy and Elizabeth's story, that when you and I, if, if I want a meaningful life, the solution is not to zero in on myself, think about my behaviors, right? We call this self-care or self-love or self-improvement. You hear the common word in all those things is self, that if I turn my attention inward, I know this is a part of our culture, if I just turn my attention inward and I think about me and I think about what I want to do and how my life could be better and then I work really hard and make it better, the best I'm ever going to have is the sum result of my own effort, which is never a masterpiece. And if you and I are really going to call ourselves Jesus followers, that means we imitate the life of one man, Jesus. What was the defining element to his life? He gave it away. Isn't he the one who said... Greater love is none than this, that a man lay down for his life for his friends. I tell you, if you try and save your own life, you'll lose it. But he who would lose his own life for my sake will find it. You want a great life? You want a masterpiece life? You want to find out what God's designed you for? You really want access into your purpose? Start giving your life away. The more self-focus I have, the less of the masterpiece I get to experience. The more I take my eyes off of myself and I put them on Jesus, ask him, what do you want to do with my life? that's when I began to see what a masterpiece life could look like. I want you to hear one more story of a young couple up on the north side um, who's been experiencing some of this. Let's watch it together. I'm Jack. I'm Maddie. And we are two pretty unlikely group leaders here at Real Life. Yeah, I'd say we were, we were definitely two people that never, never saw themselves as leaders in any capacity of church, and um, especially without like we always had this, I always had this notion that you had to, you know, go to Bible school or have all these accolades, these Christian accolades, if you will, uh, to be able to lead people. So we went first to small group for about six months and we started to feel this sort of calling, or I should say I started to feel this calling on my heart from God that he was just sort of calling me to, I didn't exactly understand what it was, but some form of leadership or ministry so maybe we can talk about like when we sat down with Shane, like more than it was just like, oh yeah, we'll do it. And then we did it. Because <laughs> it wasn't like that, I guess. How was it? Go ahead. That's how I remember it. <laughs> For you. <laughs> I'm a For guy. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, on our way to meeting with Shane, we knew that we were going to be talking about what the future held for our group. And I kind of thought about what Shane may ask and I knew that entailed maybe possibility of us helping and right away I was like no we're not like we're not going to do that. I didn't tell Jack this, but when we when Shane started talking to us and told us we need someone to take over Probably like 10 seconds later, Jack was like, oh yeah, like I, I feel like that's been on my heart and yeah, so, and I had no idea, Jack did not mention this to me at all. So I supported my husband and said, yes, I will, we will do this, whatever, if that's what Jack feels like God is calling us to do, then I trust God and Jack. Um, so. After we left that, the whole car ride home, I was just thinking of like, we can't do this. I have no idea what I'm doing. Thinking of every excuse possible. I have school, I, we had just bought a house. Like there's so much other things we can do, we have rather than taking on this responsibility of leading the group when we have no idea what we're doing. We've been in church most of our lives, but we've never been involved. We've kind of just sat back in the back of the church and went to church every Sunday, and that was kind of it. Um, so for me, I was super nervous, and I didn't feel like we were good enough, and we knew that we knew what we were doing. 
Um, so after praying about it for a couple weeks, I just felt like this is what we've been wanting, not necessarily leading the group, but we've been wanting more real relationships and we've wanted to get more involved rather than just sitting back and showing up to group each week. So I think it was something that we both were got excited about after a little while of kind of letting the thought sit in. See, I was the opposite. I know. I was excited and then the doubt set in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we were kind of just like, man, we don't know enough about God. We don't have enough scripture memorized. Um, we can't lead a group. What if we mess these people up because <laughs> of our bad theology? And that first night was pretty awkward as far as prayer goes, but um, it got better. And after the first meeting, no one died, so that was good. Uh, and people are still coming now. <laughs> I think the, the conversations that we have every week, like, it's crazy that, that even now, like, we'll still have a conversation, like, nine months in, and I'm just like, man, there was a lot of healing in that conversation we just had. Um, and it just, it really makes it all worth it. And it's just validation constantly. Uh, seeing people grow, seeing people, you know, get involved in whatever it may be, their one heart or whatever their next step is, just kind of seeing people grow into that, which has been really cool. That's what makes it worth it every week, so. Yeah, I think just continuing to grow those relationships and learning together, that's my favorite, just hearing everyone's stories and what they have to say or questions that they have and just, you know, I don't know, but let's let's look somewhere and let's figure out the answer to that. Um, yeah, we learn a lot. I would just encourage someone that is looking to, or maybe is hesitant to take that next step is, is no growth happens outside of that uncomfortable zone. Like if you're sitting in your comfortable zone, in your comfortable life, like you're not gonna see changes or anything real happen in your life. I don't. And that's how we were. We were comfortable going to church every Sunday, sitting in a small group, but we knew we were missing something and we knew that God wanted something else for us than just kind of sitting back on the sidelines. And Yeah. It was hard on Sundays to see videos like this one up on the screen of lives being changed and just being like, wow, that's nice, and then doing nothing about it, you know. I think that God's constantly calling us to take a next step into something that's typically uncomfortable for us. And for us, that's what leading a small group was. If you feel like God is calling you to your next steps and you just are hesitant about it, you're not sure if you're qualified, you're not sure what it's gonna look like, just step out in faith. Um, the real growth is gonna happen when we take that step out of our comfort zones. And that's where God's there with his arms open. Yeah, Jack asks a really good question. How do you feel, how would we feel if we just sat back and watched stories like this of lives changed, someone else's life, sit back, man, I'm okay to just be a spectator on that. The question Jack asks kind of hangs in the room from his stories, so what's the next step that God's called you to? And maybe for a few of you, your next step is you should come back next week. You walked in here this morning, and I know a lot of this is new, and you're still trying to figure out what this whole following Jesus thing is all about at the very beginning. Some of you have been in a group for a long time. You've, you've received a lot of love, just like Elizabeth was talking about. She had people have been in her corner. People have been in your corner. You know, there's a lot of people who are waiting for you to be in their corner. You know, I, I, I met Jesus because I got dragged into a living room with a guy who drove me to group every week for six months because he knew I wasn't gonna come if I didn't, if he didn't give me a ride. Um, there's people waiting to figure out what their potential is. There's, there's Jason and Amy's waiting for somebody to love their kids. There's Elizabeth's waiting for someone 
to go take a chance on a heartbroken single mom who's trying to figure out what life could look like and look at what Jesus has done with them because a few people said, it's worth my time to love you. So the question I want to ask you this morning is, uh, is if Jesus was enough for eternity to change your life, if Jesus is enough to bring you from death to life, isn't he enough for today? Isn't he enough for your leadership today? Isn't he enough for you to step into the mission? I know you're not ready. I was not ready either. I'm still not ready. Jason and Amy aren't ready. Elizabeth isn't ready. The Denistons aren't ready. No one's ready. We're just either people who say yes or people who don't. And you know, I, um, I would hate for you to step back and sit on the sideline of a masterpiece that God wants to do with your life because it was beyond your capacity or your capability or it was uncomfortable for you or you didn't know enough because in each one of those gaps when I don't know enough or I don't have enough or I can't do enough or I don't have enough room in my life in each one of those gaps including I just don't feel like it right including even the gap of my own personality and wiring. In each one of those gaps, that's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to fill and do something that was otherwise impossible because that's what makes a masterpiece a masterpiece. When you and I look at something like, you know this is true, you look at a piece of art, you look at a building, you look at a wonderful, you listen to a wonderful piece of music, and the one question you always ask is this, how did they do that? because there's a part of it that's just beyond you, right? Isn't that the kind of life you want? That's the kind of life I want. A life to say, there's no way this would ever work if the Holy Spirit, if God did not do something. If God doesn't show up in the way that I lead, I'm not gonna be able to stand here up on the stage and talk, Amy talking about how terrified she was even just to stand on a stage. Some of us are introverts in the room. Being in a room full of people is a scary step for you. There's an opportunity for that to either be a masterpiece or not. So you get to pick. If someone looks at your life, do they see all the moments where God's intersected it, or do they see the sum of your best efforts? Because if that's all you have, I need you to hear me, and I do love you, and I'm glad you're here, but you don't have a masterpiece life at that point. You have a mediocre life that you've settled for, and I would hate for you to miss that. But if you would choose to trust God and allow him to speak into gaps where you know that the mission of Jesus to go reach the world, that go into every nation and make disciples of every person, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded you, that mission trumps everything else. Trumps my personality, my wiring, my other masterpiece things that I want to do with my life. It's bigger, it's better than all of that. And it's only ever gonna happen if you and I learn how to trust Jesus with the gaps. But I'm gonna ask you again, actually I'm just gonna tell you, if Jesus is enough to save your life, if Jesus is enough for eternity, if Jesus is enough for forever, Jesus is enough for today. Jesus is enough to fill the gaps in your leadership. Jesus is enough to fill the gaps in your schedule. Jesus is enough to fill the gaps in your bank account. Jesus is enough to fill the gaps in your insecurities and your worries and your fears and all the other people who told you you'll never be a leader. You have no place in this because honestly, you, should, you just belong on the sideline or honestly, you're off doing your own thing anyway. Come be a part of something that's so much better, so much bigger than anything you could ever create on your own. You know, those 134 people who were baptized were all invited here by someone. And then someone was over in the tank with them. And someone's gonna walk with them after. And the person who loved the Finkies, the people who loved Elizabeth, um, they're sitting in this room. But you know, the people that God is waiting for you to love aren't yet. You know, the neighbor that you're, um, that you, you cross the lawn occasionally to go say hi to, the coworker who passes you in the hallway, the person who rides the elevator with you, the carpool buddy, whoever it is, what if you are the one person that God sent into their life? That was the purpose he made you for. What if the job you have isn't just so that you could be the best businessman, the best nurse, the best whatever it is? It's because God knew there were three people that work in the same office you do that are far from him and need to know him and their life is not a masterpiece. It's a train wreck. That's the most loving thing you could ever do in the world to go lead them to him. 
It's the best way you could ever love somebody is to lead them to the God who transforms wreckage into masterpieces, isn't it? Don't miss that. And there's one common theme in each one of these people's lives that defines a masterpiece life. If you really want to figure out what's the masterpiece that God made you for, the good things he planned for you to do, there's one thing you and I choose to do. Amy said it, the dentist said it, we just say yes. When God speaks, when God puts an opportunity in front of me, I say yes, Jesus, these are the people you're calling me to. I'm going to say yes. I don't have what it takes, I know that, but I'm going to say yes. Some of you are in a group, it's time for you to lead. You're waiting for someone to call you. I'm calling you. You need to lead. There are more people that need to be in your living room than are. Some of you are in a team. Someone's been calling out your potential. It's time for you to lead. It's time for you to be that person in someone else's life. And I believe God's going to speak that to you. And you know, for some of you this morning, you just need to choose to follow Jesus with your life. All of this masterpiece conversation, you almost wanted to check out the second I started talking about it because it feels so inaccessible to you. Jesus has something better for you. Jesus wants to know you. He wants to transform you. He wants to change the very makeup of who you are and transform messes into masterpieces. That's what Jesus wants for you. So if that's where you're at this morning, I want to ask you, when I have us all stand in a second as we begin to worship, I'm going to send you to the back if you want to follow Jesus. We've got shirts, shorts, towels. We're going to baptize you in this tank right over here to symbolize that first step of obedience that you and I are people who say yes to Jesus, no matter what it takes, no matter what we don't have, no matter what we don't know, we just choose to say yes, and we let him figure it out. For the rest of us, I'm going to ask you to stand with me team's going to begin to lead us, and as they begin to worship, I want you to pray with me. There's so many different things fighting for our attention. There's so many, so many either other masterpieces, or maybe it's a voice that's speaking to you. Maybe it's someone who told you a while ago or yesterday, you are a wreck, and you have no business being in this. Maybe that's yourself. Maybe that's just you. You don't need anybody else to tell you that. I need you to hear what Jesus is trying to speak to you. You are God's masterpiece. The great work that he is so incredibly proud of, that he loves, that he takes pride in, that he delights in, that he brags about. Look at what I did. Look at what I did in John. Look at what I did in Anna. Would you have the kind of life that only makes sense if Jesus is all over it? What if that was the only way anyone could ever understand your life is if you could help them understand all the gaps where Jesus filled in. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Jesus, would you show me what you've designed me to do? Jesus, would you show me the good things that you've got planned for me? Maybe you're in this conversation you just don't really feel like a masterpiece at all. Jesus, would you show me the way you see me? I don't feel like a masterpiece, God. But I know you do, so would you begin to show me the way that you see me? should pray with me. Jesus, show me the way you see me. I believe he's calling some of you to step into leadership around here. Maybe leading a group, you're not ready, that's okay. Maybe leading a team, you're not ready, that's okay. Maybe leading your neighbor to know Jesus, and honestly, you've been a little intentional in a couple moments, but you know that God has put you in their life on purpose, and you know that that needs to change everything in you. If that's you, I just want you to begin to ask Jesus, would you show me, would you, would you begin to show me what you want to do? In their life, God, show me what you want me to take a step in. And as we begin to worship, as you keep on praying, I'm going to be down here at the front, and I've asked a couple of our team to be down here with me. As we worship, if that's where you're at, I want you to come forward, and I want you to ask some people to pray over you. Would you help me understand what God's called me to do? I know that my life is meant for more than this. God, show me what you want. So Jesus, we're going to trust you with our whole life. All the little bits, all the little pieces, all the things that don't feel like masterpieces, God, it all belongs to you. God, would you clarify a purpose in each one of us that's bigger than any picture we've ever had for our own lives? God, begin to speak to us. Show us what you want for what you have for our lives. We trust you. We love you. Amen. As we begin to worship, if you're going to get baptized, head to the back. The rest of us, if you come forward.